Okay, so today we're going to go through a check lab that introduces you to some of the uh, interesting and some weird and wonderful aspects of rotational motion. Uh, we're going to start off with something familiar to you from an earlier chapter where we just look at centripetal force keeping an object in circular motion. We're going to take this thing and put 120 grams of mass to give us some weight that provides the centripetal force through this string. And I'm going to try and not hit myself in the head. And you can see that with that force on there, that's providing enough to keep it in rotational motion, but there's energy up there that stays in orbit. And if I have a slightly smaller mass on there, so a smaller rotation, a smaller centripetal force, that can adjust both the speed of motion and the, uh, the radius so that we again have a, uh, mv squared over r is equal to the force of uh, toward the center, okay? So continuing with our thoughts about rotational motion, now we have to think about what happens when things roll down hills instead of just sliding. So we've looked at uniform acceleration in an earlier lab, and we see that really all that mattered was the acceleration due to gravity. What we're going to see here in the case of objects rolling down a ramp, the shape of the object can make a difference as well, because the potential energy uh, from going down the ramp gets turned into both kinetic energy of translation and the kinetic energy of rotation, and different shaped objects have different relationships between their velocity and the kinetic energy of rotation. So I'm going to take a solid cylinder here and a bowling ball, which is a solid sphere, and roll them down the ramp and see which one rolls faster. The bowling ball got back first, so it would appear that it actually has a bigger acceleration. Now, it's not just a sphere and a cylinder. Now we can compare a cylinder and an open hoop. And let's see what they compare. Ah, it looks like in this case the hoop is actually slower than the cylinder. Okay, so you can probably be a little quantitative on that if you like. And now let's do the final pairing. Which one of these is going to go fastest? The hoop or the sphere? How about that? So next we're going to go back again to something we've seen before, collisions, but this time we're going to go in two dimensions and we're going to recognize that our objects are not point particles, so we also have to take into account again rotational motion. So if I take two pucks and I collide them just as we've done before, head on, if the ones if they got about the same mass and they're moving at about the same speed, they come to a halt. If one's got a little bit more speed than the other, they start to uh, move in the one direction or the other. But that's if they're hitting head on. Let's take a look at what happens if they hit a little bit off axis. Take another look at what happened there. I have this puck bouncing back. And it doesn't hit head on, it hits on the side. Notice that there's some angular motion associated with the fact that the centers of mass are going past each other, not on a line. Okay, now I'm going to have one of them rotating as they collide more or less head on, that too can lead to rotational motion after the collision. The motion, the, the direction of the motion, direction of rotation has an impact as well. Ooh, that could be. Notice here, I'm rotating the two in opposite directions. This one's going counterclockwise, this one's going, uh, this one's going counterclockwise, this one's going clockwise. They hit head on. They were rotating pretty rapidly in opposite directions as they hit. They weren't rotating so rapidly after the collision. Both of them going clockwise, and I'll try and get them to collide. Now they rotate quite rapidly. When they hit. And we're going to think about those for a minute. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to show uh, the effect of collisions with objects that are somewhat bigger than the little parts on the screen. I'm on a table that can rotate. Chris over there is going to throw a ball to me, and you'll notice if he throws it to me, straight at me, and to the axis, or I throw it straight to him, I really don't rotate very much, although I'm starting to rotate because I can't do it perfectly. But whereas if he throws it to me and I catch it way over here on the side, I start turning. And if I throw it back to him, 
I turn even faster. And I keep turning more or less until I put my foot down. So now what we've seen is that in things like collisions and uh, forces, we can uh, have an influence on rotational motion and that there seems to be something like a conservation law going on here because if the ball had some rotational motion because it was with respect to my axis because I caught it off axis, I start rotating after I catch it. We're going to see that a little bit more dramatically in a demonstration that's somewhat familiar to many of you who have seen figure skating. I've got two masses here in my hands that I'm going to hold out right at a reasonably large distance would give me a large moment of inertia as I start to rotate. Then I'm going to bring the masses in closer to the axis to give me a much smaller moment of inertia and what will happen to my spinning as I do that. So here I'm going to start up spinning. There I go. Now I bring them in closer. Count. Don't try this at home. You get quite dizzy. But notice my speed of rotation depends on where I'm holding the masses. Okay, now another thing you've learned in the lab, or you've learned perhaps in the lecture, and is obvious to you if you've uh, thought about rotation, is we've got at least two directions of rotation. Right? We always talk about clockwise and counterclockwise. It turns out that makes a difference in conservation of angular momentum as well. So here I've got a bicycle tire that I can start spinning. And viewed from the top, that is, I believe, going clockwise. Now I'm on, the rotate, uh, I'm on the table, not rotating, but what happens if I change the orientation of the tire? Yep. Okay, so let's get a little bit faster. Okay. what happens when I rotate it back as I come into the view. Ah, now I'm spinning the other way. There's some friction going on here so things don't work out exactly as we might tell you to do would happen in the textbooks, but what I hope you will notice is that the direction makes a difference and the angular momentum of the total system, tire plus me and the table, and the root turntable, is what's conserved. Okay, now welcome to the bonus round. What we've talked about in class and what we've seen in the demonstrations so far is that angular momentum is something that's conserved and we've been able to talk about clockwise and counterclockwise. And you may have remembered that in class you talked about how you can come up with a direction for uh, rotation by curling your fingers in the direction that something is rotating and then your thumb actually tells you whether it's along this side of the axis or that side so you can attach a sign to that motion. What we want to do in these next two demonstrations is show you that that direction is actually a three-dimensional vector, the way you've talked about things in other parts of the class. So let's start with this simple demonstration of a bicycle tire that will show you that this vector is really a vector in three dimensions. And along the way, you'll learn about why it's a little bit easier to ride a bicycle than you might have thought when you were very young. So consider this. We have a string holding up this axis and clearly everybody knows what's going to happen if I let go of the bicycle tire. It's going to flop down that way. You might look at that and think that that's clockwise. So the question is, what's the direction of that rotation? Well, I curl my fingers and it says the direction is actually toward, you, toward the camera. That's where my thumb's pointing if my fingers curl around there. Uh, so what we're going to do now is start this rotating, and I'm going to do the same thing while this wheel is rotating. And what you see may not be what you'd expect. Okay, so I get this rotating. So I hold it like this. Now remember I said that the torque from gravity was in that direction, toward you. The tire's not falling down anymore. What's going on? The torque is in the same direction, like I said. When this tire is over here in this direction, the torque is toward you. That torque changes the angular momentum, which causes it to go in that direction when it's over here, that direction when it's over there. So that's the vector nature of angular motion 
right there. And like I said, it's a lot easier to ride a bicycle when the tire really wants to stay up, even when it's not properly balanced. Okay, demonstration number one of the vector nature of angular momentum. Okay, so we want to do one more demonstration that, again, gives the same thing that we just saw with the bicycle tire in terms of the true vector nature of angular momentum. Uh, one of, we, what we have here is what's called a gyroscope, which is just a big stainless steel ball on an air cushion. And what I want you to notice is I turn it over like this. If I let it go, clearly something starts the system in motion. There has to be some torque acting on this because going into rotational motion. And that comes because the center of gravity, center of mass of the ball rod system is not coincident with the center of suspension from the air. So I've got one force coming down from gravity, another force coming up from the air, but they're not together, so there's a net torque there. And what I notice is the direction of that torque. If I go like this, again, as I view it, it's counterclockwise. As you view it, it's clockwise. Or if we use our right-hand rule, if I look at the direction of the motion, it's this direction, so the torque must be toward me in this case, is what we've been saying. So now what I want to do is, that's what happens if I start in a situation where there's zero angular momentum to begin with. I go from zero to a net angular momentum in this direction. When it's over there, it flips around because now the center of mass is on this side, and so now the direction of the torque is in that direction. What happens if I do that same thing, but I now give the object a finite angular momentum to begin with? What's going to happen? Because I now let the torque act on it. Remember, the torque over here was toward me. And what's happening is the torque changes the angular momentum, but now instead of changing it from zero, it changes it from this direction to this direction. And it keeps going around. And when it comes over to this direction, suddenly the torque, as we said before, the mass of the center of gravity is over here, suspension is here, so the torque is now that way. And again, what happens is the angular momentum precesses around as a, as a result of that torque from gravity. And we can play around with that right now. So right now, viewed from top, this is rotating clockwise because the center of mass is over here, as we said. I can put this on and change the center of mass. And notice now the torque is on the other side, of the center of mass is on the other side of the moment of suspension, the center of suspension, so the torque is changed, and now I'm precessing in the opposite direction. And I can even find, if I'm clever enough or patient enough, a spot where that net torque will be zero, which is pretty close to here. So what will happen now if I'm at this point where it's really not percenting, oh, percenting a little bit, and I stop? I've got no net torque, so I don't process, nor do I flip over, because now I've arranged things so the center of gravity is right above the center of suspension. Okay, so that concludes our introduction to angular momentum. What we want you to do with this lab is look at all of these demonstrations and see if you can understand the physics behind them. It's a check lab, so you don't have a lot of calculations to go through. But normally you would have had a chance to get your hands on this and get experience with it. Take some time to look at it and appreciate what you're seeing and see if you understand it. That's it for now.